All right, so um, welcome everyone to the Eleanor Davis and Jillian Tamaki panel. Um, Eleanor is a longtime illustrator, a very successful illustrator. Her books include How to Be Happy, uh, Libby's Dad, You and a Bike and a Road. Uh, Jillian Tamaki is also a celebrated illustrator, and her books include Skim, This One Summer, Sur Super Mutant Magic Academy, and this year's release of Boundless. Um, we're going to begin today with uh, presentations by both artists, uh, then we'll get into a little bit of a discussion between the artists and have some time at the end for a Q&A. So um, thank you all for coming out, and if you are ready to begin, you may go. Yeah, I, well I'm going to go first because mine, mine is really stupid and then yours is really <laughs> profound, so we'll get like, I don't have to follow that, you know, when you're like all crying. Anyway, um, and we'll also, I hope this works out, but we'll, let's see. No. <clears throat> uh, Sharon finally dragged herself away from the computer. She was instantly glad. She should have done this hours ago. Before that last batch of tweets. She was still sure she was right, of course. She had argued calmly from both an academic perspective and from a position of lived experience. Still, no one likes being yelled at. It was refreshing being outside. Some of spring still hung in the air. The world felt mercifully large. Ding, ding, walking into the thing. 550. This man knew nothing of the whole nasty business. And that's the end. <laughs> no, I don't, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. It's not over. It's not over. <laughs> um, the laughs continue. Uh, okay, so, a rustling uh, sound of leaves gar gar barking and running. This is insane. I cannot keep doing this. This is not appropriate behavior, nor a good use of my time. <laughs> All the urgent issues facing the world, and I find myself in this exact spot again and again. Donald Trump is president, for Christ's sakes. Sweat bead sound. <clears throat> oh, but I'm not harming anyone. That's the end of that comment. <laughs> um, I'm closing this door. It was our third month coming up short. We've just been squeezing by. I'm exhausted. Oh no! That's terrible. This goddamn city. That makes me so sad. I wish I had bought more books. <laughs> we sold magazines and coffee. It's like in Toronto, everything is a like Blank store and coffee shop. Like, you know, it was like, bookstore, coffee shop, like skateboard deck, coffee shop <laughs> store. <clears throat> I am so sorry. If only I had bought more of those bookmark pen thingies you kept by the register. <laughs> we should have had more author events, stock more graphic novels. <laughs> People don't read anymore. It's a disgrace. You'll find your way. You're too smart and talented not to. Keys in the door, jingle, jingle. Would have it killed you to have bought some bookmark pens, you fuckers? <laughs> <clears throat> Very Toronto. <laughs> this is an ad based on a conversation I actually heard at a bar. Um, I've never felt a connection like this before. She excites me. She's so funny, so smart. The sex is incredible. She's Dutch. What? That is so hot. <laughs> How old? 30s. 30 or like 39? 36. Okay. I'm not going to throw my family away for someone in their 20s. That would be insane. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> I really am walking away from my life. 
Yeah, man. I've never been happier. <laughs> Um, and again, I always say this at the end of this a little bit, but like, I, I was on Instagram and people were like, either like, you are a monster and you're just gonna like, never find happiness because like, happiness is just gonna elude you because you're a bad person. And then people are like, you go, like, you live your life. Like, you need to like, pursue like, who you are, like, all this stuff. And then this last story is from my book, Boundless. Um, I'm gonna move it along. Uh, perhaps it was a flawed idea in retrospect. Oh, Darla, you dummy. It's flat as a pancake, not flat as a cupcake. Bing bong. Ha 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 ha, laugh track. Aww. Ooh. <laughs> it was a different time. You could never make something like it now. The whole culture has become so chicken shit. The idea of a sitcom porno was conceived by me and Ron Francis, who I'd met in the writer's room of Stages, which had been canned the previous year. The concept was a show that blended what everyone loves about situation comedy, a beloved cast, comforting plots, and, of course, laughter, with sex. It makes sense when I put it that way, right? Well, what can I say? It was the 90s and we were doing a ton of cocaine. Cut. Fantastic. That'll work. God, those shoots were fun. We could not stop laughing. <laughs> Darla Nakamura starred as Darla, a young Midwestern single just arrived to New York City. Theme music, probably a saxophone, <laughs> jazzy keyboard, <clears throat> steam coming out of a sewer grate. <laughs> uh -oh. Growing up, the excitement of the big city. You know the story, you love it. Of course, she gets into lots of adventures and a few tight spots, haha. -ha. It was really sexy stuff, though, all in all, pretty tame. Darla, both the character and the real girl, were wholesome. We were aiming for a general audience. Ding. <laughs> Everyone thought Darla Nakamura was going to be a real star. I'm not going home, Lewis. When I came in here, I had a hundred dollars in my pocket and a head full of stupid dreams. And now, now I don't even have those. But I have something better. I have you. I love you. That's great, Darla. <laughs> Doing a little line reading there. Um, the pilot was not well received. We managed to squeak into production anyway after Ron and I agreed to work on the script. In my opinion, though, it hardly mattered. Interest was through the roof. People were very curious. In the end, we were canceled mid-season. I'm less sore about it now. They, they were 12 solid episodes. I think we did all right by Darla. Hey, I bet you didn't know we have some famous alumni. Fox Vanderhaeg played Fabian in episode four. We had plans to extend his role later in the season. Alas, now a war correspondent. As for Darla Nakamura, I'm not sure where she ended up. Hopefully married to a nice guy with a couple of kids. Sweet girl. A few years ago, someone uploaded the series onto Google, and we got a little attention online. And whenever this book gets translated, the translator is like, uploaded the series to Google? Like, I don't get that, like, it's supposed to be like a square middle-aged man. I'm just, like, having to explain that weird... Um, Tick. Um, I'm tickled people are connecting with the show. I even asked, get asked to go to fan conferences sometimes. Fans of what, I'm not sure exactly. Maybe the internet in general. <laughs> Dude, oh my god. It's amazing to meet you. Thank you. I'm a huge fan, haha, of you and Darla. Haha. -ha. Yeah, hey, um, so what was it like to work on the show? Was it, uh, you know, crazy? Ah, uh, well, it was a lot of fun. We had a great crew. Don't get me wrong, I am grateful. I can't say I relate to the kid, but I can't say I relate to the kids I meet. I don't like what some of them have to say about Darla. Maybe it's their attitude, a little too snide, too winky winky. 
I never thought we were making high art. We put a lot of heart into that show. There's nothing wrong with being sincere. That's the end of my reading. Oh, wait. I think yours was... Yeah, one. Everybody, uh, I'm Eleanor, and I'm really honored to be here with Jillian and, and Jim. Uh, I have a, my new book um, that just came out from Koyama Press this spring. It's called You, A Bike, and a Road. Uh, so last year, in, in, 2000, in 2016, I went on a solo bike tour, starting at my childhood home in Tucson, Arizona, and heading towards where I now live in Athens, Georgia. Um, and I kept a comics diary while I was on the road that I, that I uh, posted online as I went. And those comics wound up becoming this book. Um, so the book is uh, for a little, little half of, little less than half of my trip. I was traveling along the U.S.-Mexico border in Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. Uh, and the presence of border patrol along the stretch of my trip was uh, extremely intense. Um, for roughly 800 miles, uh, I estimate that I passed or was passed by 100 border patrol trucks, a dozen border patrol helicopters. Uh, at least two Border Patrol centers and one Border Patrol blimp. Um, the section that I'm going to share with you is, is different from the rest of you in A Bike and a Road. Uh, for one thing, I think the rest of the book is, is a lot more lighthearted and, and even kind of funny, uh, while this story isn't particularly funny. Um, like the rest of the book, it's, it's nonfiction, um, but I intended it to be a standalone piece, and I wanted to read it to y'all today because uh, I think the, the issues swirling around uh, what happened um, are, are really important, and I'd like to, to share them with as many folks as possible. I'm going to spit out this candy. <laughs> I'm doing a slobbery thing. <clears throat> I'm moving through farmland in West Texas. The mountains of Chihuahua, Mexico are on my right in the distance, and between us is a tall, dark strip of fence. A little black car goes screaming past me. And then a border patrol truck. Then, a couple miles ahead, it's the little black car. It's empty. What's going on? They're going to try to lasso him. I'm going to go watch the roping. He crosses under the bridge. I thought he was a big man, but when I move around to see his face, he's thin and young. He's walking through the water. The border patrol, deputies, and EMTs walk beside him on either bank. Eventually, someone starts saying, we can help you, we can help you, man. And he comes to the bank of the canal, and he half climbs, half gets pulled out, and they push him down and handcuff him, and he's screaming hoarsely. Then the EMTs bring a stretcher, and they uncuff him again so that they can take his wet shirt off and they wrap him in blankets, and they take him away. But right now, for a long time, he's in the canal, staring straight ahead, walking slow.
the end. Wow, that's uh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, you know, in preparing for this talk, uh, I've been a fan of both of your work for a very long time. And the thing that first attracted me to your work is something that's uh, described in the program for this panel is that it's very beautiful. Uh, you know, and it's comics. I think that, that that's the first thing we see a lot of times. But the other thing that stands out to me is that you guys both use a variety of materials um, which is somewhat uncommon, and yet you retain what I think of as very strong voices. And I wonder about the way you feel materials relate to your storytelling. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I come from an illustration background, and that only in that it's what I was trained as. I wasn't didn't take cartooning, you know, as a program or anything like that. Um, and the the at is the Alberta College of Art and Design, and they were very like into experimentation. And Rick Sealock was one of the teachers, and he was just like all about like getting messy, <laughs> like fooling around with like. And so I love that. I kind of got a taste for that, and like, um, and I did a lot of editorial illustration for a long time, and that is so just job by job, and like you can kind of. It's very low stakes, especially when you're starting out and you're just getting paid like a hundred dollars or something to do something for an alt weekly, like rip alt weekly weeklies. But um, and it was great, and so like you could just do whatever you wanted because they were paying you basically nothing to do um, illustrations for them. So it was really fun. I it's just a thing I find fun, and I have a short attention span. And so my attitude towards comics was always that it was going to be a thing for me because I didn't ever think it would make any money. <laughs> and maybe that's a good attitude to go in with, but um, I always assumed it would be um, a part of my practice that was gonna be a subsidized thing, you know, by much more lucrative illustration. So, hey, if I'm doing it and I'm not getting paid that much to do it, then I might as well be able to do what I want. And so um, there's a little bit of a psychological permission to give myself to, to do that. And I think that that's, um, it wasn't intentional, ended up that way, but it is a question I get a lot from like younger students or um, other professionals and um, that they kind of think that that's interesting about my work, that it is it looks different, but I, I hope it retains a core, you know? Um, and that's what I'm more important to me, that the, the core, and it's drawing, it's always drawing based, but the, the materials or the surface can change. Um, for me, it just, it's, you're trying to find the right tone uh, for the the comic, uh, and it just never seems to really the the style that I use for one story doesn't seem to fit the tone that I'm trying to do for the next thing. So then I kind of have to mm -hmm. experiment and mess around. And then a lot of the the stylistic choices are for kind of embarrassingly uh, banal reasons. Like um, my comic Libby's Dad is uh, set at a pool party and um, a bunch of little girls and I'm kind of nervous about drawing water so I n didn't want to draw it in black and white because I uh, having the swimming pool I wasn't sure if it would you know read as a swimming pool <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I was like well I have to have it be in color um, which is kind of not very not a very romantic reason to to choose your medium but I think it is interesting what you sort of said at the beginning where um, there's just so much packed into the surface, you know, and the art of it um, that are it can gives it, it gives it a mood or it gives it a menacing mood or it gives it a playful mood, and then you could either that can reinforce the story, it can subvert the story, you know, and it, it's a parallel layer of information that you don't even have to write into it. It just becomes ingrained in the story, and so I love playing with that juxtaposition and that you can have a whole level of communication that is like independent of what is actually written. Yeah, absolutely. I think as a reader, that's, that's something that I take away from a lot mm -hmm. of both of your work, you know, and trying to kind of interpret these visual symbols and, and what extra information can I derive from those, mm -hmm. you know? Um, like there's so, just there's so much menace in like that Libby's dad, like story, <laughs> even though it's about kids and it's really colorful. Yeah, it's interesting uh, in the example of Libby's dad is that it's, 
very sparse in certain ways, mm -hmm. but I don't feel anything is missing story-wise. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it seems like the information is, is, there's so much information in it, but when I try to like deconstruct that story, it's done with very sparse selection of, of elements, and yet the storytelling just feels rich and solid, mm -hmm. so. Glad, glad you agree. <laughs> you did it. I, I, no. I, I, that's an interesting story because a lot of people don't. Uh, a lot of people don't. They're like, it wasn't about anything. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. So glad. Uh, but you glad like constantly are sort of expressing. Um, not uh, you don't uh, dismay that people don't get what you're trying to say. I express dismay. Yeah, I, I feel well, like... the goal is to have people understand what I'm trying to right, say. Right, but you don't feel that people do. A lot of people... I mean, I, I, mean, I, I read the reviews and they say, I didn't get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did. You did get it. I, I, a lot of folks don't get it. and um, I guess if every... I, what I tell myself is that if everybody did get my work, then I probably would be right. being too obvious. Yeah. But uh, it's... Um, it's always something I try to be aware of, like mm -hmm. who it does work for, who it doesn't work for. I noticed a lot more women seem to understand what Libby's dad is about than uh, men do, but um, that, that's by no means universal. So it's just, it's interesting mm -hmm. different, that different audiences really change it. Um, I wonder how much, um, I have some, some questions about sort of editing, but also some of the work that you have shared publicly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, both of you have serialized work online or posted work online to get feedback. And one of the things I find uh, I'm curious about with creating comics is how much you think about audience and how you represent that in your process. Like, do you have readers? Are you working with editors? Um, you know, what, what is that experience like before the work is released and you're getting that feedback? Um, you know, where is that coming from? Is it mostly you trusting yourself? Or do you have some people that are able to give you an outsider perspective? Yeah, I mean, it's so different from, like, doing a thing like Super Mutant Magic Can We, where it's, it is form. Like, you can say, like, it never matters how much li how many likes that anything <laughs> gets and what anybody says online. Like, that's just not true, probably. Like, um, if somebody loves that one character, then, like, of course you're going to then want to develop that character because you're like, oh, yeah, that's kind of interesting or whatever. Um, so... Um, for sure that's like an influence, but you have to be <laughs> stubborn or, you know, uh, focused enough to know where to draw the line with that. Cause I think that you can get a little, a little bit sucked up with, um, think putting the audience first. Whereas I think you have to not necessarily put yourself first, but put the story first or put the characters first or whatever, you know? Um, but it, because of my whole career has been sort of parallel to the internet and, um, and I've always shared stuff online. It It is a, such a different process to then incubate a graphic novel over like three years or something like that where there is no feedback. And it can feel like such a um, uh, <laughs> um, not like a little unhealthy because you're just like trying to imagine the feedback and you're trying to imagine like w how it'll be received. But there is something really special about then just like plunking a big thing down in front of people and like letting them process it. So it's a different process. And I think that both the result ends up different um, when you're getting like a little bit of feedback and the feedback is running parallel to the creation versus just here it is, like <laughs> here's like a big graphic novel. And then it really is like birthing a thing. And it's like, yeah. What was it like for this one summer? Because you, like with uh, Boundless, those were stories that you mm -hmm. had put out individually. Most of them, uh, yeah. Most of them. Um, so you kind of had an idea of how people would respond to the individuals. But you were working on this one summer for so long. Yeah. And then it was, I had no idea what it was about. I don't think anybody did. And then it existed. And, and I, I think it's like it's fun to mix up that yeah. experience, right? Where It must have been really lonely. It's very lonely because you're, you working on it and also you're like, this is totally horrible. <laughs> like, what am I, like, this is garbage. Like, I, I, what am I don't, I want to just cancel this whole project because yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just, you are, or you're like, I'm a genius. I am like, the, <laughs> I am like God's gift to whatever, but it's like, and then it's like both of those things, right? Like, um, and, uh, 
but I think there is that's it, whatever works for you. You know, if like that works for you and you get more pleasure of delivering this giant project, that's great. But a lot of I do feel with cartoonists, and that's why like serialization I don't think will ever go away. Is that it's like it's not sustainable to go away for three. Yeah, I don't know anyone who likes to do yeah. a whole graphic novel. Or, yeah, and then like it's just too lo lonely. Yeah, and there's like you, to have no feedback on something yeah. for a giant project like that is like can be a little bit of a mind yeah. trip. <laughs> were, you, were you surprised by the feedback that you got on this one summer once it came out? Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't. It took a little bit. I mean, it's now the most banned book in America. Thank you very much. No, just kidding. Don't look. That's like horrible. <laughs> like, uh, but I don't. I mean, I don't consider myself like a controversial cartoonist. I don't court controversy. I don't um, aim to rile people up or anything like that. And um, even though I knew, like, oh, like there probably be some things in here, and like. But it really was once our editors were like, ooh, like oral sex. Like, are you sure you want to put? And then like Mariko was like, yeah. It's supposed to be scary when the teenagers are talking about that yeah. stuff. Um, but uh, it it was like, um, you never know. Once it's out of your hands, it's like the world's thing. And like that, it changes the meaning of the book, even in my mind. And they overlay, their own, the world overlays a, another piece of information over top of it. Um, but yeah, and then I did not, I didn't think it would be that controversial, but. You, it, you don't have to be that controversial to be controversial these days, yeah. I guess. You, you said <laughs> a lot of people were big fans of the teen boy. They thought the teen, the teen boy character was hunky or something. Uh, well, it depends on who you talk to. If you talk to y the younger spectrum of the kids, which are like 13 or 14, the reader, you know, this reader person, like they are only interested in the young kids, yeah. you know? And then if you talk to older teen, or they're, all, they're mostly interested in the teenagers. Yeah. And then if you're an adult, then you get the full scope of it. But like, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting, because there's parallel narratives and like what you glob onto kind of speaks to <laughs> who you are. You know, you both mentioned uh, the process being a lonely one. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could talk about strategies that you employ to combat that loneliness. <laughs> Uh, there's a program called Twitter.com. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's my only, <laughs> that's my only tip. <laughs> and you're married to a cartoonist. Is that good or oh, never mind. <laughs> that, makes, that makes it less. I mean, well, a little bit. Then you can you can like they understand your crazy schedule or like why you might be like terrifically frustrated or something. And Drew, Drew actually, in answer to your pre previous question, Drew edits me. My husband, Drew Wang, is also a cartoonist and he's amazing. And we edit each other's work a lot. And uh, so that's that's a huge part of my process is, is uh, making him read these absolutely illegible, hideous thumbnails and being like, what did you think? <laughs> <laughs> Were you moved? Were you scared? Yeah, it's like, you didn't cry. I was kind of hoping. <laughs> And it's just like a stick figure. <laughs> the little dead with an arrow. Um, I don't know. Are you lonely? I'm not that lonely. Oh, well, no. I, it, was, uh, it was something I think both of you mentioned um, just in that process. It's not, very not solitary. In, right. Yeah, yes. which I think is like a little bit of a different thing. But um, I do uh, actually this, like I do have to uh, almost aggressively schedule friend time like I need to do that I'm like all right you know like this feels like it's too much but no like you're gonna go out and like reach out to people and <laughs> have dinner yeah, with them and stuff because you can just I mean you're running your own business as well and you can just like work all the time but yeah yeah. yeah well I wonder um you know both of you have done uh what would be considered graphic novels you know these long sustained pieces but you've also been doing shorter Mm -hmm. stories uh, after that, and I wonder if that is in reaction to that experience of, of, you know, spending a long time on a project and maybe not wanting to go through that again, or, or maybe, you know, not being uh, ready for a project like that again, so, you know, possibly that is something that's you found appealing mm -hmm. or as a way to... I, I did a kid's graphic novel called Secret Science Alliance that came out in 2009, and that working process was horrible absolutely nightmarish. I mean, my publishers were fine and my editors were great, and, uh, but I just was so uh, isolated. Um, 
and I was younger, I didn't have quite the uh, coping strategies um, that I do now. And it was before Twitter. Twitter <laughs> didn't even exist. Uh, and I hated it so much that I said I'd never do another graphic novel, and, and I uh, just stuck with short stories after that. And I just finished roughing out my first graphic novel since then. So, um, 150 pages. I'm very excited. About <laughs> <it>. and, <laughs> um, now you can't pull the plug on it, though. You've committed to oh, these God. people. True. Like. Uh, so what I'm hoping to do differently for this one is uh, serialize it. Yeah. Know, like you're saying, put it out on uh, issue by issue, hopefully on Gumroad or something like that. I mean, so many of my projects are direct reactions to the project I've done before. Like, right. um, this one summer was, you know, it's like three years and you don't, nobody sees it. And then it's a big thing when it comes out. And then you're talking about, and just our, the way our industry is a little bit more predisposed to like wanting a graphic novel. Cause it's a little easier to talk to about. It's a little bit easier to market, I think, or, um, for whatever reason. Um, and so after that, I was like, I just wanted, that's when I start my webcomic. Like I want to not just incubate a thing for like three years. I want to release, I want to write more and like get and have more of like a ongoing relationship with a reader or an audience. Um, and, and, uh, and that was great. It was like such a refreshing, like change of rhythm. And, and so I do feel like it, a lot of the projects I'm working on then are, are a reaction to what I came before because um, it just feels like exercise. You know, you're like flexing your different muscles and whatever. Ellen, are you, um, I, you know, listening to interviews with you before this, I heard you talk about taking a year off after that graphic novel and just drawing for fun. Mm -hmm. And Jillian, you just mentioned the word, you know, refreshing. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of you mentioned exciting in regards to one of your pieces. And I wonder how, if, if you could talk a little bit about that, about trying to maybe shape your process or follow these things that are fun or exciting. Uh, I don't know whether that's a strategy to, you know, to offset some, mm -hmm. some harder part of the creative process, but I find that it, something that I try to do is, you know, I want to be excited whenever yeah. I sit down to draw yeah. Or, yeah. or something, and I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. I haven't heard somebody that took off time and just, you know, drew for fun for... Yeah, it was really important. I don't know... Uh now it seems, now when I stop having fun drawing, I, I immediately know something's terribly, terribly wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and it makes my drawings much worse. Um, so a lot of that year that I took off was figuring out how to, you know, I had this very kind of like, very tight pencils and, uh, and Drew was inking it and we were, it was, you know, it was a very, it wasn't very intuitive uh, process and it didn't feel like I had a relationship with the the drawings in the way that um, I'd prefer. Uh, and then that's just really hard because a lot of the time you just don't, it, it's, um, for me, it's reliant on, after I've drawn for six hours, I kind of tapped out, you know, and the drawings start looking bad and it stops being fun anymore but you kind of have to draw more than six hours a day <laughs> a lot of the time. So it's a, that's a tough balancing act, um, getting the work finished and also having it be fun and exciting work to do. I mean, I do think that there is, uh, I mean, I taught for a long time and you, when they, you know, the kids put up their stuff on the wall for a crit and you can just immediately, they didn't, it's not that it even needs to be good, but you can just tell like which pieces have energy and which ones don't. And it's not even that that one's good. And that they may be actually spectacular failures, but like it has an energy to it that is like very positive. And so, um, and something can be even like well done, but it's just like so dead. And so I'm acutely aware that like, Images and art have like ener energy. It's like so hippie, -ish. but like um, <laughs> so I think that I'm a, very aware that like if I'm not engaged and like attentive and it's not even feeling positive, but like engaged with the thing, like that doesn't translate to like good work. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm pretty conscientious of like setting up my schedule or my life or my projects to try to. You can't, you know always guarantee that you're gonna be able to do that like consistently but um uh 
so that you can retain that like sense of freshness or energy or engagement um, on a, as much as possible. <laughs> I have to erase al almost any time I draw something between two and six o'clock in the mm -hmm. afternoon. Mm -hmm. I just have to delete it. Yeah, you know, I have to erase it all and delete it all. That's why, like, a, I can like an all nighter never works for me yeah. now because it's just it's not good. I, you're gonna get much more out of it. You just sleep eight hours and then get up early a little bit and you know yeah that's for me um i just have one more question and then we can uh, open it up to the q a but you know you've both mentioned uh schedules and and sort of that this is a business and i wonder if you have any practical uh advice for people or th practices that you do yourself uh you know keeping the same hours or taking time off or i, I don't know try mm -hmm. you know anything that you do to kind of manage that aspect for me, it's very, I work best in the morning. I know that's not true for everybody. A lot of folks are, are night owls, but I try to get up early and get as much shit done before noon as I can, because by noon I start uh, really losing, losing hope. <laughs> um, yeah, so don't, I, prioritizing, like emails can come later, uh, that other stuff can come later. The drawing has to come first thing in the day. Um, Take lots of walks. Get yeah. exercise. I eat. always make the bed. Oh. <laughs> like, I feel like you need to, like, I'm, okay, I'm, because I work at home, right? So, like, I have, like, a studio in my apartment. And I've always had a studio in my apartment. But you really have to delineate, like, because it gets very womb-like. Like, oh my, I work and I eat and I everything in this, like, one space. And so, like, yeah, I think you have to draw, like, psychological lines of time and, like, space and and stuff like that and like i always go out for a walk before i start work and it's like very uh i'm not highly routine or like i it's like i'm like i need to go for, take a nap now or in a shower or go running or something it is very flowy but um i do think that there are like certain little things that you have to do in the day to like flip over to like work mode yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i don't work that hard I if know. i started out with a walk <laughs> If I started out with a walk, my day would be over. Okay. <laughs> as a reward. Yeah, I have, yeah okay. I have to get right to the drawing desk and get it all done as much as I can. And then if I've been very good, I get my walk. <laughs> right. You're constitutional. <laughs> well, um, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. about, like, muscles. I definitely enjoy both. Like, they're different muscles. They're different challenges. Um, I've only worked with my cousin, though. Um, and so that's, like, a very special relationship in that she's the only... Um, she was, like, the first person I ever made a comic with, you know? Um, and so that's actually how I learned to make comics, was sort of adapting her very theater script-like scripts. Um, it wasn't a traditional comics process because we didn't know what the hell we were doing at all. <laughs> um, but um, it it is, as I've done more of my own work, I really appreciate the books I do with her even more because those books I could never make on my own. You know, like just because I'm, to be honest, I'm involved with the books we make way more than she is just because it's like so much labor. It's just like, you know, she, she'll be done it in a couple months and I'm like with it for years. Like, um, but I can never tap into that emotional kind of writing that she does. She writes in a very specific way. It's very dialogue driven that I just don't think that that's the, the book that I, I can make by myself. So I really appreciate that like um, with a collaboration, you, um, you're, the frisian creates something new that is like, again, refreshing. Cause like when you, it's all on you, it's so much you <laughs> and like you know it inside and out and it's like that's cool too but I like when s two people bring come together yep. all right uh, anyone else did I see yeah please uh, step up to the mic if oh god <laughs> um well while we wait for a question oh, we, we, just raise oh, our hand. we can yes. hear them but they're trying to record it. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're repeat. Well, we're repeat. Oh, okay. Oh, you can you can just speak up. We'll just uh, repeat it. Okay, cool. Need to. Um, so, Jillian, I was talking to you earlier, and you said when you're not working on your personal stuff or illustration, sometimes you promote yourself. And Eleanor, if you have anything to weigh on this too, I was wondering if you could go into the specifics of how you do that. 
Uh, I don't have to promote. You, you want to repeat your Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So How the, do you promote yourself, self basically? Right. Um, I, I actually don't promote myself too much now in a very intentional way. Like, I don't send out postcard mailers anymore. I don't send out, um, like, emails or anything like that, which I think you're probably going to be doing more of when you first start out. Um, and I certainly did. You know, <laughs> I'm sending my mini comics to draw on a quarterly and all the, that kind of stuff. But... Um, uh, because at some point your work becomes self-perpetuating promotion or something like that. Um, so that's, but I do, I absolutely consider like Instagram promotion and like Twitter to be promotion. It's like soft ephemeral promotion or something like that. But in a way it's like, I love that it's free. It's like a lot more accessible to people. And I've always loved sharing work online like it's like the it's a very pure instinct that has become very fraught for yeah. people where it's like oh my god it's how do I do it how do I do I feel pressure to you know show my lifestyle blah, blah, blah. it's like a big deal and um it really is a, a thing you have to find what works for you but at the core I've always loved talking to other people online yeah. and like sh and show I made a thing like let me show you so I try to keep that spirit in the way that I use those tools, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's really interesting and I think it's been a net, net positive for yeah, sure, but it's, yeah. it's, uh, can feel pretty gross um, in a lot of ways to it, just being an interesting person. You want folks <laughs> to want to pay attention to you uh, enough to not mute you <laughs> on Twitter no. or, or, or to, to, to hit follow on Instagram. Um, but I'm glad it didn't exist when I was starting. But I guess it was so different when we started because now I feel like there does seem like so many more people. And that's great on one yeah. level, but then it's also like, how do you make yourself stand out yeah. is like a that's big that's the only reason I have a career I never did any mm -hmm. of the traditional promotional mm -hmm. stuff I, I just was online and created content people liked I guess people the c like, word this? content you know <laughs> <laughs> it's really you know and I started doing it because I was like hey I can tweet about my butt and nobody can stop me fuck you yeah. <laughs> and then people were like we love you to tweet about your butt More butt <laughs> tweets please Let's give you, you love it. You're so authentic. Oh my god! Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I should be even more authentic, and then I'll get the big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be really authentic for money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> weird position. <laughs> um, I think we have time maybe for another question. Sure. Um, have you ever had someone? Both of you. Mm. Have you ever had someone be like, be like "Okay, th this is like really cool, and I love this idea," and then someone just be like. That's stupid. You shouldn't say that. You should, you should tell this narrative. And, like, how do you deal with, I guess, if you've ever been in that situation, like, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so uh, I guess it would be that you're getting feedback that is of the opposite type of feedback. Yeah. One, one person is saying this is really great, and one person is saying this is really terrible. Do you mean, like, ne like online people? No, like, I mean, like, meet space. Like Meet space. Like is that real life? <laughs> uh, like, like, <laughs> like actual editors or just randos? <laughs> oh my god, randos is one of my favorite words. Okay. Um, I guess either or. Oh sure. I mean, like an editor, I have to pay attention to. A rando, I don't have to pay attention to. Anybody <laughs> who's ever disliked either of our works has been wrong. No. Never listen. <laughs> No, but like no, but like but in all seriousness, like that is again, and just teaching is so instructive because you see it in microcosm, and then you see it year after year after year, and how it repeats. But it's like the best students are always ones that at one point will just tell you as a teacher, like, eh, like <laughs> thanks for your feedback, but I'm doing my thing. Like, like they, you know what you're trying to do. You might not be able to actualize what you're trying to do yet but you know what you're trying to do and so you can't be sort of kicked off the path right like yeah. you do have to be a little bit stubborn and clear-minded um and you might not have the skills or be quite achieving that yet but like you you need to have 
some self-possession or something like that. It doesn't matter if people like it. It matters if it works. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And maybe what you're trying to do isn't something that people are going to like. And you, and yeah, especially as women, I don't know. Like sometimes we really are like, this person didn't like my thing. And it's just like disturbing. It's just like, I'll get over it. You know what I mean? Like I have to learn that, you know? And I'm always just like astounded when people are like, eh, I didn't like it, eh, fuck you. It's like, wow, I need to learn how to do that. Like, cause it, there is a thing of like, oh, they did, I made a thing and they didn't like it. It's like, not everybody's gonna like your thing. In fact, if somebody doesn't like your thing, if everybody likes it, then it's sort of middling, you know? It doesn't, it's not striking. Nobody really, really likes it if nobody hates it. Oh boy, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. I guess maybe one more quick question. Anyone? There's somebody over there. Oh. I'm working on what you were saying about being women writers. You are women writers who write with protagonists who are women. Do you find that sometimes you can perhaps be pigeonheld by men as like chick writers? Which I know is such a trick mm-hmm. question, but how do you navigate that? Oh, fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> fuck those guys. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you can't win. Yeah, you can't win. Rules. And it's yeah. so it's such like a weird granular uh, where in some situations I'm like, yeah, like women and other people are like, I'm or, or in other situations I'm like, I'm just a writer. Like don't like single me out like that. <laughs> like it's so of the, you know, like the situation and the intent and the yeah. context and like how you're saying it and like are you just trying to hashtag diversity fi me, yeah. you know, like or Per, I, you know, person of colorify me and yeah, I'm just yeah. like oh my god like um and then sometimes I love it being that you know um held up in that way so again it's just so complicated but um it's funny I think when I started off as an illustrator I was um my work was very about women you know and uh women focused and that felt um maybe unusual at the time because like illustration was very man at that time when I was starting and rendered and you know um and now I feel like it's uh so much more standard and that's great so hopefully some positive change with that um so we've come to the end uh are you guys doing signings today any more signings that you can tell them where they could find you after this draw on a quarterly table for half an hour only so uh I'm at the fanographics table um, I think at four o'clock. Let me check my phone. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. All right. Soon. Four o'clock. <laughs> well, I'll thank you uh, yeah. very much, Jillian and Eleanor. Thank you. And thank you all for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.